Welcome to The Tipping Point. I'm your host, Joanne Johnson, and tonight in the studio, I have the honor and privilege of having the legendary Bob Rathbun with us. Bob is an eight-time Sportscaster of the Year in Virginia and Georgia and a nine-time Emmy Award winner. He has been the voice of the Atlanta Hawks for the past 25 years. Yes, 25 years. And he is also the author of the book, Fast Forward Winner. Let's go ahead and get ready to welcome the legendary Bob Rathbun. All right, my friends, as promised, the legendary Bob Rathbun. Let's welcome him right now. How are you? Hey, Joanne, I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? I am better than I deserve, my friend. I am so glad that you are here. You know, we were talking in the green room about what a treat it is. I know your schedule is jam packed, but I wanted to I wanted to get with you because you celebrated 25 years um, with the Atlanta Hawks. And that is such an accomplishment. I mean, you are the longest play by play announcer in the franchise history. Correct. On TV. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. How does that feel, Bob? Uh, I'm very fortunate uh, to be in this chair for that long. You know, the you know all about television and yeah. how uh, uh, it can be rather uh, life changing uh, when a new boss comes in. And I've survived three owners and five general managers and countless changes at the network. And to be able to to stay in the chair uh, makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm doing a good job and you know, fans uh, still want me around. So, yes, you know, let's, let's stay with it. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And it's, you know, people so often they come and go, and I know that you have had you uh, just a, a wealth of, of a career. You really have, because you do so much more. You're an author, you started in broadcasting um, and, and, I, and radio, you've done everything, just everything. And you've worked in all over the place. I want to go back to the beginning because I've, I've read up on how you got started in this, uh -huh. in this industry. And it's really interesting. Can you kind of share with folks a little bit about being a boy and how it happened for you? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think about it almost every day, uh, how lucky I was growing up in a small town in North Carolina, Salisbury, uh, right between Charlotte and Greensboro. Next time you're driving on 85, you'll see it. Yep. And, you know, I don't recall my parents egging me on to do it. I just picked up the telephone on a Sunday afternoon and I called our radio station in town and the announcer on duty answered and I introduced myself. I'm a 12 year old kid. And, he picks up the phone and I told him how much I loved uh, listening to the station and the sports and everything. And he said, well, you know, why don't you come down and we'll give you a little tour of the, of the station. And my mom and dad took me down and I fell in love with it. The second I walked in the door, I just thought it was the neatest, coolest thing I'd ever seen and was always a sports fan and a radio fan. And that began for me, Joanne, an, an every Sunday ritual almost where I would hang out at the station. And I would do what 12 year old kids would do. I mean, I took out the garbage and I'd get the announcer, drink of water and just kind of hang out at the station. And one Sunday afternoon, the sportscaster of the station showed up and he said, well, if you like radio and you like sports, why don't you come help us broadcast these American Legion baseball games in the summertime? Okay. So I would go and I would get him a hot dog and keep some stats and show up and, you know, kind of just be a, a kid helping out, had no real responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And one night he said, well, are you ready to make your debut? Uh, I guess I am. And I got the mic in the bottom of the seventh inning and broadcast a half an inning of a baseball game. And that's how it started for me. And our first baseman hit a home run. I have no idea what I said, yeah. but uh, a lot of people the next day, uh, were saying, uh, did y'all listen to the American Legion game last night? Yeah. Well, who was that little girl Marty had on <laughs> broadcast in the bottom of the seventh? My voice was a little higher then. Okay. Uh, but that's how it started for me. And I worked in that little radio station for a long time and um, wrote for the newspaper in town. We had a daily paper still going strong, the Salisbury Post, and uh, wrote, covered my high school team. You know, once I got my driver's license, that was the big key. I could go yes. cover the games when I was 16. 
And uh, that's and I've been doing this ever since. So it, it's been a real blessing uh, to me. And I I think back often of how lucky I was because that announcer on duty could have easily said thank you and hung up the phone and never invited me down. He could have, but talk about being in the right place at the right time, Bob. But it's more than that. I mean, obviously, you've had integrity drilled into you at a very young age and you did what needed to be done. It wasn't about, oh, I just want to go and get a microphone and I'm going to be famous right now. You were putting in the work at a very young age. Yeah, I, I was very lucky. That little radio station uh, sent four major league announcers on in their careers. So I had great mentors and teachers there. Didn't know it at the time. You know, they were like just the guys at the station, but they were all really good broadcasters. It was a solid little radio station. Um, and then I, I got a chance to work at the newspaper. So that taught me the print journalism side of things, mm -hmm. which helped me apply to the radio side. But there was another thing, Joanne, going on in that little town uh, for years and years and years. It since moved to Winston-Salem. But for uh, 50 years or so, Salisbury was the home of the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association. Mm -hmm. And every year they would hold and still do their annual awards ceremony where the best uh, winners in the states, all 50 states, writers and casters would come into Salisbury. The national award winners, Hall of Famers would come in. And again, I go back to being 16 and getting a driver's license. I was placed on the transportation committee, which meant go to Charlotte and pick these guys up at the airport. And I would bring them back. And I had in the back seat of my car the heavyweights in sports casting and sports writing, men and women, uh, that would come to Salisbury for this award ceremony. And I think the one thing it did for me at a very young age was it demystified the business for me. Mm. You know, these are these are just regular guys and, and gals who are into sports casting. And I would, you know, of course, pick their brain and ask them, you know, I want to be a sports caster just like you. What advice would you give? And they were all so willing uh, to to help, uh, you know, try this, do that blah, blah. It, it was just a great, I can't imagine growing up any other way. It was fantastic. You know, I'm a little kid and, and here I am now, you know, uh, a few years later, uh, still doing it. 21's and, not old. Come on. 21's not still old. thinking about those days back in Salisbury, how lucky I was to get started. It's a beautiful area too. And I actually lived in Winston-Salem for a while. Oh, okay. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. I love that part. I'm in South Carolina now, but I used to live in North Carolina. It's wonderful. The people are wonderful. And mm -hmm. I like how you said, Bob, how, how friendly they were, how kind, and obviously how humble too, because as you rise with your fame, I think it's so important to remember where you started and to help other people. And I found that, you know, in my career so far too, that everyone that I'm in contact with, including yourself, is that, yeah, I'm going to take time and talk to you. I'm going to share with you. And we can't do what we do without people like that. Yeah, I think it's important. And I think because of the way I was treated, I tried to pass that on to the broad, young broadcasters that asked me for help and advice and whatnot. So uh, keep it going. It's the one business, Joanne, and maybe you feel this way too. It's the one business where if you call, if you're interested in television or radio or whatever media you want to get into these days, if you take the time to reach out um, and just call like the news anchors at the, you know, in Spartanburg or Greenville, yeah. uh, they'll get back to you. You know, they'll they'll reach back out. I, I think it's an industry where we really do appreciate the breaks we got to get where we are. Mm -hmm. And we want to pass that on to the next generation of broadcasters. So um, I'm very proud of our industry in that regard. Absolutely. And, and the only competition truly we have is with ourselves. Would you agree? I mean, it's we don't need to be worried about who's trying to come up or it's not about taking from you. It's about wanting to learn from you. And if they're reaching out to you, it's because they want to emulate something about you, something that you've accomplished. And and it's key to remember that, because imagine you know, there could be a lot of closed doors as you're trying to learn and grow. And that doesn't feel good. And like you said, you have to share that same experience with other people. And it, and it's just helpful. Yeah, it, it really is. It's uh, there is no pie. You know, everybody says, you know, <laughs> there's so many pieces in a pie. There is no pie. Not today. Uh, anybody with a microphone and a laptop 
uh, can do this. The, the question becomes, you know, do you have something good to say? Yes. Do you have something that can be consumed in a positive way? I mean, anybody can get on and rant and rave that to me, that's not broadcasting, but when you can make a difference in people's lives, now you're getting somewhere. Can you touch people with video, with audio, with storytelling? Yeah. That's, that's the difference. And that's a huge part, Bob, of what this show is, because we talk with national entertainers and game changers, people who are really making a difference in the world and who have gone after that golden ring, has grabbed it. Um, and that's why one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was your book as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But here's the thing, you make a great point. Everybody has a microphone, everybody has a computer, and it takes more than just getting on and just rambling about nothing. And on this show, I really want to get to the root of what drives my guests. Um, how did it happen? You know, what were the pitfalls along the way? How did they overcome challenges? Because mm -hmm. as a child, I saw an interview that you did with a young boy and he did a tremendous job. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was precious. And he had, a, he had a really great tone. Everything about him was wonderful. He was asking really good questions. And I thought he's watching. And it's important for him to understand. And you were so tender and kind with him. And you were saying basically what we're saying now is that anybody can get a microphone, but do you have what it takes to, to stick with it? Do you have something to offer, something to bring? Yeah. Joanne, in broadcasting, there are fundamentals and they're fundamentals for a reason. Uh, it is the basis for which we communicate. Okay. And if if those are sacrificed, then I think your your platform disintegrates pretty pretty rapidly. Um, I, I, one thing I try to tell these young broadcasters: said, don't make the same mistakes that I made. You know, as you're coming up, uh, if you'll do these certain things, then you'll be fine. You know, um, I think one of the big things is credibility. I think it was drilled into me at that little radio station and by those sportscasters that would come into town that being on a platform like this is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, having a microphone and a camera and having people rely on you for information is a big deal. And Radio stations and TV stations back in the day were are on the air through the Federal Communications Commission as a public trust. And that yes. means we trust you to deliver the message. So if you can ground yourself in those journalistic principles of fairness and integrity and professionalism and doing your homework and being well read and, and well versed on a topic before you have the chance to broadcast it, yeah. then I think you got a chance to succeed. But if you try, if you're in this just to bang a drum, call attention to yourself, say something outrageous, you're talking to the wrong guy. That's, that's not me. I'm sure that's not you. And right. that, to me, that's not broadcasting. It's got to be about the guest. It's, you know, as, and I think as in this role as an interviewer, I can share a little bit about myself, but the focus is you today. The focus is my guest. And I need to be willing to completely listen to you and to hear what it is that you're saying, not worried about what my next thing is going to be. Um, that's why in this particular show, I go off. I don't really have a script. I write a few questions down, but I let it flow because I really am interested in you and who Bob Rathbun the man is and giving you an opportunity to share outside of whatever it is that you normally do. Um, and I think, I think that's key is being able to listen in that way. Would you agree? Oh, there's no question. I think, and you've mastered it for as long as you've been doing this. Uh, the best interviews that come out, um, I try to, to teach the students, ask your first question but then train yourself to listen to the answer yes. because your next question should be based off the first answer that you get. And a lot of young broadcasters that are just starting off are so worried about that next question that they completely lose uh, what was said in the answer. So um, I think that's a, a good technique to try to learn early. Um, 
to get the most out of your guests and to find out a little bit more because they'll they'll say something. If you're if you're well prepared for the interview and you know the background and all the, the, the stuff, then you've got the confidence then to let the conversation just kind of yes. take its natural course, I think. I no, I agree. And you talk about going after your dreams in the book, Fast Forward Winner. Okay. And you're you're talking about the importance of there being a plan. And that kind of piggybacks on what we're saying right now. Anybody can write a book. Uh, anybody can get a microphone, right? But if you want to be successful, you've got to have a plan. Can you share um, a little bit about that? And I have running on the ticker, again, Fast Forward Winner. That's available on Amazon.com. And I encourage everyone to get a copy of this book. Um, very well written. It's got great advice. Share with us, Bob, about that, because people are looking and saying, I want to do what you guys do. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for that, Joanne. Um, the Fast Forward Winner is nothing more than my story of how I got started and, and how it happened for me. And to me, if you follow those six steps, uh, it might not be your life's work, but it'll be something tangible at the end. I think one thing that stymies a lot of young people and really, and it could be a veteran getting out of the military. Uh, it doesn't have to be like a teenager or a college student, a young adult. It could be anybody, anywhere. But I think one thing that holds people back a lot of times is some of the feedback that they get early on. And what I mean by that is, uh, say you announce to your family, your cousins, uh, that you want to be a singer, a dancer, an actor, actress, whatever. And to hold you down, or maybe their self-esteem is not great, they'll say something like, well, who do you think you are oh, yes. to, to want it, right? Yes. You've experienced that. Yes. So what I try to stress in the book is, is before you get to that point of saying to the world what you want to do, look inward first and kind of decide what it is you'd like to go after. You know, I apply it in the book to broadcasting, but you could do it in any really walk of life. But find out it's like the concentric circles test in a way. You know, what am I good at? What do I like to do? What can I make money at? And where they meet is kind of what you what you go after. But just kind of look inside yourself. What is it I want to pursue? What is it that I want to to do with my life? And kind of research it in a way. Uh, read up. And then ask people that are already doing it. Yeah. And once you get a few checks in that background about, well, okay, this guy tried it that way. She tried it this way. She did this. Then you can kind of put them all together and say, okay, this is the path I want to take. And then go public. Okay. And realize that as you do go public, that it might be, um, you could, I call it a 20 second time out in the book. You might have to adjust, uh, you know, it's not working this way. Well, let me try it this way. So you might have to adjust a mid course correction, if you will. Uh, like you're going to the moon, just like the astronauts did. You just kind of have to make that mid course correction, but eventually you'll get to the, to the finish line. People want to help you. Uh, and if you, if you've got good intentions in your heart, then it, it'll happen for you. The one thing I do tell, the young students about broadcasting is don't fall in love with just being a play by play announcer. There are a myriad of jobs in this business. Yes. You might be better suited as a producer, a director, uh, audio person, cameraman, technician, producer, director, color, sideline. I mean, there's a bunch of different things that you could do. You could be writing scripts. You could do documentaries. You could do news. You could do weather. You could do traffic. You know, there's a zillion different things you could do. So kind of like going, going down that buffet line back when they used to have buffets before the yeah. pandemic. And, you know, you don't put everything on your plate, but you, you sample a little of this and a little of that and try this and try that. And then all of a sudden uh, you say, well, I really like that. And that that's a, a, a an endeavor that I would like to dive into. I really like makeup. I really like lighting. Uh, I, I'm not into the acting on stage, memorizing lines, but I love being behind the scenes. So open yourself up to all those possibilities and you can make it happen for yourself. 
being flexible, absolutely, because we don't know what we don't know. So if you think that here's your plan and this is what you want to be and you start along that path. And like you said, there's going to be other doors. Right. And you open a door and you might you might discover that, oh, my gosh, like you said, I'm actually better suited for X, Y, Z. And I actually am going to love that more. But if we get our minds set around this one thing and we fixate on that and we think that's the only thing that I'm going to do and we're not willing to listen to feedback, listen to you know, put in the work, um, whatever it is, we're not going to go as far, Bob, as we could. Right. If we're willing to be flexible. Yeah. And you're never a finished product. No. Um, you know, I'm still I still have to do my daily regimen of reading and preparing. Uh, that's 365 days a year. The one thing about this business, uh, on my side of it, from the talent side is, and I had a producer tell me this years ago. He said, you know, what you do is kind of like ice cream. You know, your strawberry ice cream, the next guy is vanilla ice cream. The next guy is chocolate ice cream. Now you're all good. But the person deciding might just like strawberry ice cream. Yes. That doesn't mean that vanilla and chocolate aren't great, but for that particular job. And sometimes that's a hard thing to kind of get through. I'm good. I did my work. I had a great tape and all this, and I didn't get chosen. So you do have to have kind of a thick skin in that regard. But uh, other than that, I think pretty much if you stay with it, you're going to find your niche and, and something you'll be happy with. It's interesting that we're having the last few interviews that I've done have had that same theme in regard to auditions, you know, because mm -hmm. I do, I interview a lot of actors and um, casting directors and so forth. And they said exactly what you said is that it's not necessarily your talent or it's, or it's, it could be, you don't have the right color hair or the right color eyes. Mm -hmm. It could be anything that people who are looking to book you are looking for a very specific thing. It has nothing to do most times with how talented you are or are not um, and sticking the course and staying with it. So, you know, I, I love this. I love this conversation, Bob, because again, I had told you in the beginning, I want to talk about sports, but I really wanted to talk about you, the man. And I am curious though, with all of your time on the Hawks, what's your favorite moment of being an announcer with them and being part of that family? I think probably the being the conduit between the team and the fans, you know, they can't get close to them like I do. I live with the team. We travel together or on the plane together or in the hotel together. Uh, they want to know what that life is like. And so part of the job in, in, of doing the games is to say to the fans, you know, um, hey, we got in at 2.30 last night, uh, checked into the hotel. We all got to bed about 3 in the morning. Uh, we were up this morning for shoot around and, and uh, now we're heading over to the gym and blah, blah, blah. And they love having that inside information, uh, if you will. And that's, that's part of it that I really enjoy because they can't get that closeness. They'll never be on the plane with us. They'll never be, you know, in the locker room and talking to these people, but I can, and I want to share that experience with them. So I think in the overall, I think that's probably, you know, as much fun as you can have as a broadcaster when you've been doing a team as long as I have, you know, I, we had a terrific playoff run, as I'm sure you know, this past yes. year. And um, I can't tell you how many people would reach out to me and tell me, like, I've been doing it 25 years just with the Hawks. And they'll say, I, they're 30 years old and they got families. And they're like, you're the only voice I know Yes, with this team. You know, I started watching you when I was five and now I'm 30. And uh, and and to see the team win uh, means so much to them. So I would say that's probably the most fun of all. It is going to be strange when you finally decide to retire, which I hope is no time in the future, the, the near future. I'm sure it's not because I can see how much you love what you do. It, it will be that when that day does come long from now, it will be a huge loss. But what does it look like for you, do you think, to actually retire? What will you do? I, you know, Joanne, I can't even, it's not even in here. You might not even do it. No, I mean, it's just as long, I mean, I'm blessed to have health and yeah. energy and, you know, the whole nine. And I, I've got that curiosity, like I'm two generations removed from these players. So it's a challenge for me to 
to get to know Trey Young, who's 22 years old, and John Collins, who's 23 years old, and Anyeka Kangu, who's 20. But I love these guys, yeah. and I can't wait to know more about them and help tell their story. So that word just doesn't enter into my cranium. Um, and I love that. I love that. And I was thinking like 30 years from now it is yeah. when you retire. You know what I mean? If you ever do. I asked my husband the same thing. I said, what will we do one day when we retire? He says, I don't think we will. We enjoy working so much. Mm -hmm. And it's such and being in the media is, is who I am. And I can't imagine not doing anything else either. And some people choose never to. And I hope that when that day comes 30, 40 years from now, when you decide to say, hey, I'm considering retiring, um, that you choose not to. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you. You're such an asset and, and you're it's you're a fixture to all of us. Well, thank you. Um I, you know, I'll know. I'll know when it's time. Never. But I don't feel it now. Uh Never. I still I can't wait to read the box scores. I can't wait to watch. You know, I'm one of those people, Joanne, that I can't wait to get up in the morning to get started. And I hate to go to bed at night because I don't want to miss the late games. So I still feel that way. And um uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Maybe in another 25 years, then you can say, okay, let me, let me think, is that something I want to do 25 years from now? <laughs> but, but this is Bob, this is a testament though, to actually following your passion. Again, going back to what this show is about. I love everything that you're saying. And to, to see you, when you talk about what you do, you absolutely beam and you're a testament to someone who followed their passion and who is doing what they were truly called to do. And I'm sure you don't even feel like you're working, do you? It's just, no, mm -mm. no. Um, it, it has, has never felt like work. Um, the challenge to be good at it, you know, that's a, that's kind of a different story sure. because that's the, that's the grueling, you know, watching the tape and, you know, oh, I got to read another book and I got to read another press guide and another set of, but that's, that's kind of the, the nine to five of this business, but the doing it, Don Shula, the legendary football coach had a great line that I just love. He said, the closer I get to the stadium, the faster I walk. And oh. I feel that way. I can't, I'm, I'm like, this is my most miserable time of the year because I got no games. Yeah. I got to wait till October to get back in the gym. Right. Right. And I'm like, come on, come on, let's go. Let's do the draft. Let's get our team together. Let's go to Vegas for summer league. Let's go, let's get going. And I, I can't wait till the schedule comes out. The happiest day of my summer is the day we get the NBA schedule for next year. Oh, I'm going to be in New York here and I'm going to be in Chicago here. And I love it. I love it. I love hearing this. This is so great. And and that's how we should feel about what we do. And mm -hmm. and I think too, you know, is as a message to our viewers, if you don't feel like that, you might want to reconsider, you know? <laughs> because because it's just doing what we love. I mean, I'm the same way, Bob. I get up every day and it's like, okay, what wonderful thing will happen to me today? What am I going to be working on? And it'll be, you know, 12, 15 hours later and I'm still working and I didn't know that I was. And my husband will say, Joanne, come, come on. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I love it. I get completely entrenched. And I hear you saying that same thing. Yeah. And from the spiritual side, mm. I just think, and, and I mentioned this in the book, but I just believe that each of us has been placed on this planet to do something special. Don't know what it is. That's kind of our life work is to find out what it is. But if it's if it's in your heart, if you've got this kind of enthusiasm and excitement for it, you're probably on the right track. So enthu, you know, comes from God. Yes. Enthusiasm uh, is pretty divine. And if you've got that for whatever it is, whatever passion you have, doesn't mean you're going to make a zillion dollars off of it. But what it does mean is you're going to get up every day and do that work because it brings you joy. And if you can find that, then that's what you should be doing. Not what mom and dad said, not what cousin said. You do what you want to do. And even when you follow that call and you listen to the Lord and you 
do what you know he's asked you to do. When people circle around, and I'm going back to the beginning of our conversation, Bob, when they tell you you're not good enough, you can't do it, who do you think you are? You have to be willing to push through that because mm -hmm. what's more important is to know whose you are. And mm -hmm. once you know whose you are and you understand that you can do all things, right, through Christ, no who question. Christ you, no question. then you, you can do this. And if he's called you to it, he will get you through it. Mm -hmm. I believe that. And it's, um, you know, the, the culture we live in, you know, there's so, so many voices out there yes. that uh, grab our attention, uh, particularly young people. You know, you're trying to be liked and you're trying to fit in and you're trying to do all these things. And uh, if you just kind of keep that, uh, that notion alive that I'm going to find out what it is I'm here for and I'm going to go after it and I'm not really going to let anything get in the way of that. Um, I think you'll have a pretty happy, successful life. I really do. So Bob, I've got one last question for you. Mm -hmm. What, what are some last minute things, tips and tricks that you would tell people who want to do this, who are on the verge of maybe giving up because they feel like they keep trying and trying and it's not happening for them. Yeah. I, I get that all the time, Joanne. Um, frustration, not moving up in the business, et cetera. I, I would answer that in a couple of different ways. Number one, again, going back to what we talked about earlier, try something else in the business. Uh, if it's not happening for you as a broadcaster, maybe you could be a producer or a director, a program director, or a news director, whatever, uh, and see if that, that challenge uh, intrigues you. But I think overall, the one thing that you have to do and I learned this from Jim Rohn many, many years ago, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And if you do that, the job will get easier. The opportunities will be more plentiful. Uh, what, what does your daily routine look like? Are you sharpening the saw, as Stephen Covey would say? Mm -hmm. Are you reading the books? Are you doing the training? You know, how is your vocabulary? How is your on air? When's the last time you took a reel and had somebody take a look at it to see, well, I think, you know, the lighting could be better here. Your pace could be better here. In television, a lot of these play by play guys will come to me and say, you know, what do you think of my reel? And I'm saying, well, dude, you're a storyteller. Tell the story of today's game. That will take you oh, a good 20 years, to probably get ready for. But you got to work on your voice. You got to work on your knowledge. You got to know the rules of the game. You got to work with your partner. You got to work with your producer, your director. This is an all day, every day type of thing. So, for those who have been frustrated, I would say first and foremost, look in the mirror. What am I doing to make sure that I'm the best of me out there in all aspects of your life? Okay. And then go and, go and have somebody take a look at your work and see what they think. And if you, if you agree with the feedback that you're getting, make changes. I, Lord knows I had to, you know, this is uh, when I switched from radio to TV, uh, man, you know, it's a whole new world. In yes. television. And the role of play by play is different. You know, I don't do play by play on TV like I did on radio. You can't, you talk people to death. They can see the game. So you got to put in the subtitles and learn how to work with your, uh, color person. So I, I would say those things, Joanne, don't, don't be frustrated without giving it um, a second look at yourself first, the product you're putting out second, and then see what happens. But just because somebody says, I mean, how many no's can you take? 100, yeah. 200, 300? You might get that many. But that one yes may be the one that opens the door forever. So I just say stay with it. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you were here. And I and I really, I'm honored and privileged to have you here today. Thank so thank you. I appreciate you asking me to be on. Yes, and thank you for taking the time. And God bless you. And we're going to be looking for another at least 25 years. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. 
How wonderful is he? Um, again, we're hoping he retires no time in the future, another 25, 50 years, uh, because I don't know what we'd do without him, quite frankly. He's magnificent. Um, it's, you know, it's been wonderful tonight being with you. Make sure that you guys are liking and sharing this broadcast. Share it with everybody that you know, people that you don't know. Uh, we want as many eyes as possible on it. I love you, and I just appreciate you guys coming back every Monday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. Until next time. Please be humble, be loving, and above all. Hello, Tipping Point viewers. My name is David Chuddick, and I'm the host of the Weekly Wealth Podcast, www.weeklywealthpodcast.com, and I am also a financial advisor. If you have anything that's keeping you up at night with regards to your money or finances, email me at david at parallelfinancial.com or check out my Calendly link, www.calendly.com slash davidpf. Let's have a 30-minute conversation. Let's talk about what next steps you may have in your financial life.